The whole point of this is that the, there is food everywhere we never need to want, even if for some reason our supply chains are, are interrupted. And in the summertime, you know, mostly what we looked at on the last slide was plants that are going to be there for us in the wintertime or in the ends of the years, either the fall, early, early winter, or late winter, or spring. And that was the last slide. This one is the stuff that's out all summer long. And we're going to start at the top left with wood nettle. There's two nettles, and this is wood nettle. Um, you're not going to see this growing out in the sun. It's going to be in the woods. You might first discover it by being stung if you're walking in shorts. So if you do get stung, you can come back and identify it and collect some very good greens. They're high protein and, and well worth eating. And then on the right, and then catty corner, all the way to the left is what's known as cat briar or smile axe. This is a, a common woodland briar in the mountains. It'll really tear you up if you bump into it. But I love the tender shoots, which you see on a plate, they're all collected of what it looks like. They've got this resinous look and they have this complex flavor. And if you were trying to sustain yourself on this, this might be a great time to get the kids out to gather them because you don't get a lot of volume gathering them. But they are highly nutritious and quite a novel food, which is a good thing for us, I think. We've, we've reduced the variety of what we eat massively as we've become more civilized. And we used to have a much more varied diet, and that varied diet, varied diet ensured that we were getting all of the minerals and antioxidants that we needed, all the vitamins and everything else. And so, it's kind of good to get out and get that. And for me, my favorite way to eat this now, since the supermarkets are open, is to graze on it as I walk through the woods in the springtime. And another thing to know about this is while this is really shooting and growing a lot, you tend to not have as much deer pressure because the deer are hitting this one really hard. And they're oftentimes like spending more time in the woods, chowing down on the, the tips of the smile axe or cat briar. And then the next one down is a favorite of mine. And I kind of left, I put the insect um, covered up one in there because I wanted to make a point that this is also an incredible plant to have around for all kinds of reasons. It's milkweed. Um, it's the one on the right corner. And what, it, what is great about it is that it has two different infestations of pests, the milkweed seed bug and the milkweed aphid. Now, why would it be great that a, bug, a plant is infested with pests? Well, it's basically feeding all of your beneficial insects for your garden. They get, here, they get to come here and really chow down and get a lot of protein and then they propagate and are there for your garden. But what is, it's got several different ways it could be eaten. The one I really want to emphasize though is the buds, which I've known were edible for years and never have gotten around to eating them. And then I got served them this year by the same friend who served the Taganese Minuta to a friend. And her friend got um, mouth blisters. There's no problem with mouth blisters from this. My only issue with this is the butterflies need the flowers of this so much that I feel guilty eating too many of the buds. But the buds cooked up are wonderfully reminiscent of broccoli. And I highly recommend experimenting with them. And this year I'm going to do some experimenting. I'm betting now when I think about it that if I pick the buds, they're just going to grow more. And if I don't do that too hard, I won't hurt the plant and I can get a picking off of any batch of, of milkweed and still get them to come and flower. Maybe a little later, and that might be a way to control when they flower, which is all the better for the insects, because the predatory insects are going to feed on the aphids and the milkweed seed bugs, first and second instar. But then the butterflies and the nectar, and nectar feeders are going to be feeding on the flowers. So you want the flowers to be happening. And most famously, what feeds on this and is utterly dependent on it is the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly is laid on the leaves. Its eggs are laid on the leaves in the milkweed and it won't make it if it doesn't have milkweed to feed on. And then a, the adult monarch butterfly will also feed on the flowers, as will all kinds of other butterflies. So it's a wonderful plant. And if you haven't had milkweed buds as a, as a vegetable yet, it's, it's revelatory. Um, I've been allowing a significant portion of my homestead to go to milkweed just because the butterflies are in so much trouble. And I know also that the infestations of aphid and milkweed seed bugs are going to feed all those predatory insects and we have to take care of our insects. They're in trouble now. But I realize that now I get the reward of that because I'm going to be able to pick a whole lot 
of milkweed buds. And I can't believe I've waited this long to try them, even though I knew they were edible. A long, long time now. All right, and then the final one is one that I talk about in all kinds of different talks. I've, I've been pushing this one for about 10 years, and that's probably because I'm trying to make up for the fact that I didn't eat it for a good 20 years when I knew it was edible. This is really an abundant weed in a lot of gardens. It's Gallon Soga, also known as Quickweed, Whiteweed, Summer Devil. My mentor and friend when I worked at the Highland Lake Inn, Tresca Lindsay, who was from Belgium, said, yes, in Europe, the French call this German weed and the Germans call it French weed. It's got all kinds of names. They're all derogatory because it is so massive in its, in its populations. But that's an advantage if you understand that it's edible because you have endless successions all summer long. It is not very interesting to eat if you let it go to seed. Right now at this stage, I purposely picked this picture of all the pictures I have because it's barely in seed. It's barely flowering and it's still fine to cut this. You won't notice the flowers. But you come back in about three days and there'll be so much stem between each one of those flowers and the leaves. And there's going to be less and less leaf, leaf and more, way too much stem. And at that point, you don't bother to eat it. But if you look just a little bit further down the row or something, you'll see another patch that's just in the perfect stage. And then several patches that are coming in successions afterwards. This is endless successions of succulent, wonderful greens that, by the way, are off the tri charts nutrition-wise. They're incredibly good for you. And they self-sow all summer long. And instead of being a weed that drives you nut nuts, just think of it as endless, wonderful greens. The same, my same friend who I referred to twice already, who this year turned me on to the um, milkweed buds, we were cooking together and in the same meal we decided to have greens with the, with the milkweed buds and I went out to gather them and I mostly gathered some other weeds which I'll show you in a little bit. But I included a bunch of this too and she said, oh yeah, that, I know it's edible. But she just seemed pretty dismissive of it. And then she bit into the food and said, what's that taste? And I said, well, let's see, what haven't you had much of? And it's like, I think it's probably the gallon soga, right? And she said, I'll have to go get some and try it and taste it on its own. And she's now utterly fascinated with the flavor. It's got its own distinctive flavor. And by the way, it was a major food in the Southern Hemisphere of the New World prior to its being conquered by, by, the, by, by Europe. It was a major food for South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. So... Check it out. You're likely to have it. Um, I, I think if I had a garden and didn't have it, I would introduce it. And I know that would drive a bunch of people who have been fighting it as a weed nuts. But I eat more of that every summer now than almost any other green. Okay. Okay, so the garden can not only be um, lovely, but it can be luscious or at least nourishing. And my first example of this is oxide daisy. I found them revelatory when I first I first got introduced to this by Mark Williams when he was giving us a, a wild food. Mark Williams um, and oh, Natalie Bogwalker, right, when they were doing a wild food talk here. I hadn't known it was edible or eaten it, and I was immediately enthralled with the flavor. It can be eaten raw. It's a fascinating flavor. It turns out that the, the daisies, if they're really daisies, are all edible. Now, you got to be sure that it's actually a daisy and not get confused. But the Shasta daisy, there's another one I forget the name of. And then this one, the oxide daisy, oxide daisy are all edible. I like this the most when it's in greens and not in flower, but you can eat it at any stage and the flowers are edible too. And, and I have a bunch of it in my backyard, so I can go out and harvest it whenever I want. It's in amongst the lawn. Fortunately, I don't treat my lawn with anything, so I can always harvest it back there. And another one that I put here, I have not tried this yet, but I had to put it here because I was really totally pleased that it's, a, it's also edible. This is Autumn Joy. Um, the Autumn Joy succulent, and it turns out that most all of the succulents are edible. You want to carefully identify each one because there's a couple that aren't. You want to be sure of what you're eating. But in general, another one that, that is edible is Ice Plant, which I don't have a picture of or I'm not talking about here, but I was quite surprised to realize that it's edible too. And so it turns out that you can make tea from the flowers. These flowers are past, so it wouldn't make a very good tea. But you can make tea from the flowers or even just make a soak them and have them as a cool drink. But the leaves also are quite a little tart and quite pleasant to eat too. Supposedly, I've yet to get to try these, but they're, they're edible and, and pretty much appreciated by a lot of people. And so the next one is Dame's Rocket. I've got a really special relationship with this because 
as it often does, it's quite the weed, considered invasive in a lot of places. It's in the brassica family. Um, first time I saw it, it just showed up at the top of our garden at Highland Lake Inn when I worked there. And I was like, what's that flower? It's so lovely. A lot of times, by the way, it looks a lot like money plant. And people confuse it, confuse money plant for this. But no, I don't know about money plant being edible. But this is Dame's Rocket. Once again, you got to do thorough identification. But once you identify it, these are very, the flowers and the leaves are very good eating, and I highly recommend them. And they can be very abundant. They're considered invasive, so you can go to town on them. And then the next one is another one that totally fascinates me. It's got a name that <laughs> kind of calls up politics these days. It's Biden's Pelosa. And it is also in the lettuce family or the Gamposa family, as you can see. And it looks a lot like a daisy, and it's also edible. It's I first got to know it as a, a plant for a protocol. Stephen Harrod Booner was our main source for information on the herbs that we could use to deal with COVID. He wrote a, two, two separate protocols early on, a 40-page one and then a 90-page one. Um, and he said at the time, I swore I was never going to write another paper or anything about herbs because it takes so much work. I highly recommend his two books. I have them in the, in the res, on the resource page, Herbal Antivirals and Herbal Antibiotics. They're wildly comprehensive. Everything that Stephen Harrod Booner does is incredibly comprehensive, incredibly footnoted. Um, he, when he approaches herbs, he talks about how to use them in American traditional folk music, folk, folk uh, medicine, how to use them Ayurved Ayurvedically, and how to use them in Chinese medicine. He gives you all the science that he has on them. You can look at the papers and stuff. And he gave, came up with a whole protocol for how to deal with COVID. And I followed that. I've passed it on to other people. And we all have you know, had positive effects from that. I know the FDA will probably now contact me and say, I can't say that. But I can say from personal, personal experience that following the Booner protocol was very useful for me when I had COVID. And I've made a lot of the tinctures that he recommended, and I've shared them with a lot of friends. And nobody that I've shared them with has, ha has had any experience except for getting better. Some people were barely sick at, the, at, the, at first, and none of them reported that they had any severe symptoms at all. People with severe symptoms found that, felt that the tinctures and stuff helped them. I actually had to look up right before the, doing this presentation, because although I knew it was medicinal, and I knew it was used in Stephen Harrod Booner's COVID protocol. I hadn't looked at whereabouts. It turns out that probably why he recommended it is, is apparently good for arterial, arterial inflammation. And that, of course, is a major problem in COVID. It's also very good for infection. It was an amazing insect plant. I mean, it was such an insect area. We grew a big patch of it in 2020, and the insects were all over it. And that is a joy for me at all times now because our insects populations are crashing. Anytime we can have a lot of flowers blooming that are attracting insects, it's wonderful. And this was really spe spectacular for that. It's quite ornamental um, in a wild kind of way. You wouldn't put it in a formal garden, but it'd be a wonderful item if you just had patches of wonderful flowers growing around your, your garden, your yard, even your front yard. Finally, and I can't remember which ethnic cooking I was looking at, but I was reading, I think actually it was Indian though. I'm pretty sure I'm going to say Indian. I was reading about Indian cooking, and lo and behold, there they were talking about using the leaves and the flowers from Biden's Pelosa. So it's also an edible, which is the case so often the plants are not only food, but also medicine. But once again, a caveat in doing more research for this talk, I saw a paper, which I didn't go to because I really didn't have time to, though I wanted to, where somebody has done a study on its use in Africa and thinks that it may be um, one of the causes for esophageal cancer in Africa. And that might be from much more consumption than we're talking about. I suspect it is. There's a lot of plants that are food, but maybe not as much as you would eat your staples right now. But you could add them to your diet if you needed food, or even add them to your diet if you didn't need food, but just for diversity and for different flavors and for adventure, not necessarily as a staple. So just to Keep up with those caveats. Do your research and check it out. And let me know if you have any strong opinions either way about how good they are to eat or whether or not they're really food at all. Just because they can be eaten doesn't mean that we necessarily want to eat them.